Um, I think so. I'm an endocrinologist, so that means I'm a doctor who specialises in the care of patients with uh, hormone diseases, um, so things like thyroid problems, and we also see a lot of patients with um, bone diseases like osteoporosis. Osteoporosis means weaker bones, which predispose um, people to having fractures. Um, my research has really been um, trying to align it closely with my clinical practice and so um, we've done a lot of research in the area of osteoporosis um, and I've called the title Accidentally Disputing Dogma because um, as you'll see much of the research has challenged existing guidance although it's by accident rather than by design it was just the way the results turned out rather than anything that we particularly set out to do. Um, Unlike um, Brendan, I think I was hope hopelessly optimistic when I did my slides, and so they're too long. So um, I'm going to try and co um, cover um, a few things, but towards the end I run out of time, and so I'll have to skip over a few slides towards the end. But I'll start with um, HIV and um, osteoporosis. And just to, to say again that the main focus of all of this has really been to try and improve the care of patients with um, endocrine diseases. So HIV is the virus that causes AIDS, um, and it was first recognised in the late 19, uh, in the early 1980s. And the first treatments became available in the early 1990s, and they weren't particularly good because the virus became um, resistant to the the drugs almost immediately. But by the late 1990s, it was recognised that if you used combinations of treatments, so at least three or four different medications then that um, suppressed the virus replication and prevented and treated AIDS very effectively. But shortly after that, those studies were um, done, um, it became clear that the combinations of treatment called HEART, um, there were a number of studies that reported that uh, there were high rates of osteoporosis and people having low bone density. So as one, many as one in five people had osteoporosis and about half of people had low bone density. And so the concern was maybe that this was going to be an important side effect of the treatment. Um, so what we set out to do in the Auckland region, we asked all the um, men in the Auckland region who had HIV infection and were taking heart if they would have a bone density scan. And we found, contrary to the existing research, that HIV doesn't cause osteoporosis. And so I'll just um, talk you through here. So we had a... Oops. Okay. Doesn't um, there's a mouse? Okay, so the HIV group um, had uh, uh, this is the average bone density of the HIV group. This is the average bone density of the control group, which was a group of men who didn't have HIV infection and were otherwise fit and healthy. And there was a small difference between the groups, about one percent, compared to previous studies which had reported um, differences of, of more than ten percent. Um, what we did find was that the HIV group was about six kilograms lighter than the control group on average, and that's um, important because weight is one of the most important determinants of bone density. So the heavier you are, the stronger that your bones have to be. So when we adjusted for that difference, um, you can see that there's basically no difference between the groups. So in other words, HIV-infected men had normal bone density for their weight. And so we went on to do um, develop uh, a research program really around that idea and showed that what was happening was that when people had uh, untreated HIV infection, they, they had Ill, poor health, they had gastrointestinal problems, and their weight dropped. And then when they got onto effective treatment, their health improved, their weight improved, their bone density improved, and they didn't have um, long -term, any long-term problems with um, bone density or osteoporosis. So uh, moving topics quickly, um, vitamin D is something that's often um, promoted as a treatment for osteoporosis, and it's, vitamin D is probably one of the most commonly um, discussed vitamins in the, uh, in the media. And um, here, I've, just on the slide, I've put some of the enormous range of benefits that are claimed for vitamin D. And if you believed uh, all these claims, you'd think that vitamin D would be really a panacea for human disease. What we set out to do was to uh, try and answer the question, does vitamin D supplementation improve 
uh, any outcome for people who are otherwise fit and healthy. And so we gathered up all the existing clinical trials that have been done on vitamin D supplements for a, for a number of different outcomes um, and to see what effect vitamin D had. And just briefly, the answer is vitamin D has no effect for people who are otherwise fit and healthy. I'll just talk you through this slide to show um, your example. So this is an example for falls. Does vitamin D prevent falls? Whoops. Um, each line down here represents a clinical trial that was um, published. These are the outcome data here. And this is the treatment effect for that study. And this line here is a measure of the um, uncertainty around that treatment effect. The vertical line here is that there was no effect. And down the bottom here is what happens this line here is when you pull all the um, studies together. So we've got about 25,000 people in these studies, and this is the treatment effect. So um, clear, strong evidence of no effect of vitamin D on falls. And when we repeated the analyses for um, bone density, um, there was no effect of vitamin D on bone density. It didn't prevent fractures. It doesn't prevent cancer, heart disease, strokes, infections, or um, any of the main clinical outcomes that it's um, supposed to. Uh, calcium supplements are also um, commonly, uh, used to be commonly used for osteoporosis treatment as well. And we did a study in Auckland where we set out to answer the question, does calcium, when taken by itself, prevent fractures? And the answer was it didn't, but to our surprise, there was an increase in the risk of heart attacks and strokes who were, um, in people who were given calcium supplements. And that had never been reported before. So what we did was we uh, wrote to all the uh, the authors of all the existing clinical trials of calcium and said, did you have any data on heart attacks and strokes during your trial? And they sent us the data and we pulled it together and analysed it. And I'll just show you um, some of the, what the results are. So this is um, the result for myocardial infarction or heart attack. And what, it show, what this graph shows is the proportion of people over time in the group that's calcium, that's the, who received calcium, that's a solid line, compared to the group that didn't receive calcium, that's the dotted line there. So for example, at two years, about 1% of people had a heart attack in the group given calcium, and a slightly lower proportion um, was in the group, uh, had a heart attack in the group that wasn't given calcium. So overall, during the studies, there was about a 25% increase in the risk of heart attack um, with if you were given a calcium supplement. So that would translate to if you treated a thousand people for five years with calcium supplements, you'd cause an additional six heart attacks and strokes and prevent three fractures. So in other words, the risks outweigh the benefits. Um, uh, what impact did that have? Well, we were able to show that quite nicely in New Zealand. So this is data on prescriptions of calcium supplements per month in New Zealand over time from 2004 um, to 2020. And you can see that before our research was published, they were increasing at a fairly steadily, steady rate. And then once um, our research was um, published, you can see that the rates actually plummeted and have remained low ever since. <coughs> Down here on this graph, this is the cost um, to Oh, are you actually seeing the moss? No. Oh, sorry. I've been pointing out what you're supposed to be looking at and you're not seeing it. Oh, oh, oh I won't point anymore. So, um, on, the, um, on the graph down here, so you, this is the cost of um, calcium su uh, supplements to Pharmac in New Zealand. So um, it, they've dropped by about 1.5 per million per year, uh, 1 .5 million per year since our research was published. Over the first five years, that was a saving to of about $5 million um, to New Zealand. So that was calcium. What about vitamin D? Research doesn't have impact sometimes. So despite the pretty good evidence that vitamin D has no benefits for the majority of people who take it, you can see that um, prescriptions continue to rise. The last thing I was going to talk about was publication integrity, but as I said, um, I was hopelessly optimistic in timing. So I'm just going to skip through to the key slide here. Publication integrity is the idea of that 
um, when you have a published scientific paper, you assess the data, the results, the conclusions, the analyses, and say, mm. are they valid and are they reliable? And we have done uh, a, re a lot of research in that area, which has led to um, a number of papers being retracted, probably about 120 papers from a research group that have published about 300 papers. And based on that work, we developed this checklist called the Reappraise Checklist, which allows people to uh, give them guidance as to how you can assess a publication to see whether it's reliable. And I've also developed a free statistical package, which has got a number of statistical tools, which you can look at and um, help guides um, your assessment as well. Uh, this is my last slide. I'd just like to um, thank four people um, who have helped um, my research career a lot. Andrew Gray and Ian Reid, who were my, started off as my clinical mentors and my PhD supervisors, um, but later became collaborators and friends. And then Greg, who is our biostatistician, and Anne, who runs our clinical trial group at the University of Auckland, have been, all of whom have been really influential in my career. Thanks a lot. Sorry, it was too long. In terms of the calcium supplements, mm -hmm. have you looked at that in relation to bariatric treatment? Because no. calcium is a compulsory supplement. Right? Yeah, no, we haven't. Could you please talk about that? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Tomorrow. Um, the, I'll help the, you if you want. Uh, <laughs> The issue with um, calcium supplements is that um, when you look at what they actually do, they increase the calcium level in your blood by about 0.1 millimole per litre, which is a pretty small amount for about 6 to 12 hours. If you take a high calcium intake in your food, you get roughly the same effect, but it's spread out over a much longer period. So I would say that probably in, um, dietary calcium would increasing your dietary calcium would be a much more effective way of improving your calcium intake than would calcium supplements, no matter what the clinical indication is. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there a last very quick question? Great. Actually, I'll introduce our next speaker.